As we uh, come together now to worship Almighty God, and be, I trust and pray that as we spend this time together worshiping God, that you be blessed and that God will be glorified. Now, I actually wasn't scheduled to preach today. It was supposed to be Lee Hutchinson, who, as many of you will know, was exploring a call to ministry within PCA. Unfortunately, due to a number of factors, Lee couldn't be here today and has decided not to apply to, apply to Union Theological College this year. So please pray for Lee and his wife Rachel as they continue to seek God's will on this matter. With regards to announcements, I'd just like to uh, remind you of the uh, uh, Holiday Bible Clubs that are still running in our area over the next coming weeks, Balagali, uh, from the 26th to the 22nd to the 26th of August, and Six Mile Cross from the 24th to the 26th of August, and from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in both cases. If you are interested in not a church member and you're interested in becoming a church a communicant member of this church, please speak to me. Um, there will be tea or coffee, etc., uh, and biscuits served after the service uh, over in the minor hall. So if you don't have to rush off, please stay uh, and have some fellowship with us in the minor hall afterwards. One item that's not on the announcement sheet is that the first Sunday in September, which this year will be the first of September, as is our tradition, it is our youth fellowship service. And that particular Sunday, it will be a joint service, as is always the case, but it's here in, in Clogher uh, this year. So it's from, uh, at 11 a.m., Sunday the 1st of September, and the speaker will be Peter Wright uh, from Growing Young Disciples. So please put that, uh, log that date in, in your mind, put that date in your diary, and come along and join with us uh, in that youth fellowship service. And on that Sunday, the connection always go goes to the work of youth fellowship those are all that i have with for you by way of announcements and now we're going to turn to god's word as you know we're going through taking a look at paul's letter to the ephesians and today we find ourselves in ephesians chapter 2 beginning at verse 11 so if you have your bibles with you can i encourage you to open them at this passage of scripture if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, that passage can be found on page 1174. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. <clears throat> Here in the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a the circumcision <clears throat> not done by, in the body by the hands of men remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world <clears throat> but now in Christ Jesus you, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself a new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ, Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And we end our reading in verse 22 and thank God for this reading from his truth. The last time I was with you in July before we went on holidays, I preached on the first half of Ephesians 2 verses 1 through to 10. <clears throat> 
Brian, one of the points that Paul made or makes is, is God's purpose in saving us. This he does in verse 10, which reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Which in essence means that whilst good works are not the, me- the grounds or means of our salvation, they are nevertheless an indispensable part of a redeemed life. Then, as we consider that verse, I went on to explain what is meant by the term good works. And in doing so, I said that godliness, living a godly lifestyle, <clears throat> is a good work in its own right by virtue of how it reveals God to those around us. However, when we consider this requirement, we can all too easily fall into the trap of letting the fear or letting fear of the consequences of breaking God's law become our chief motivating factor. But if we let this type of fear motivate us, then the good works Paul speaks of here are not done with enthusiasm and they give us no pleasure. You could say that we will do them begrudgingly and such an attitude is toxic to a life of discipleship. So what should our motivation be for doing the good works that Paul speaks of? Well, the answer to that question is gratitude towards God. And Paul, knowing this, having highlighted the necessity of good works for believers, went on to remind the Ephesians why it was that they should be grateful towards God. He does this in verses 11 to 22. Now, Paul may have written these words to believers around 2,000 years ago, but they are still relevant for believers today. Therefore, as we consider what he wrote, we discover three things that we as believers need to remember. Firstly, we need to remember what we once were outside of Christ. We find this in verses 11 to 12, wherein, particularly in verse 12, we read, Remember that at one time, You were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Therein Paul refers to the nation of Israel. And by that he simply means God's chosen people. He also speaks of citizenship, which is merely a reference to to the rights, protections, and privileges afforded to the people of God. In Israel's case, it was the covenant blessings which they, as God's people, enjoyed. Non-Israelites, or foreigners, as Paul so described them, were excluded from those rights, protections, and privileges by virtue of the fact that they were not God's people. That word excluded tells us the seriousness of their situation. They were barred, prevented from, or forbidden from the rights, protections, and privileges of God's people. So they could not demand them. They could not buy them or earn them. Such things were, therefore, inaccessible to or out of reach for them. As a result of that, they were without hope, and without God in the world. What Paul means by that is that without a true knowledge of God, their situation was hopeless, and because they were unaware, or because they were unaware of their sin and need of God's forgiveness. And therein Paul reminds us that separate from Christ, we are excluded from the rights, privileges, and protections afforded to God's people, which today is the Church of Jesus Christ. Outside of Christ, we are excluded from the promises of the covenant of grace. We are excluded from the forgiveness of God and receiving the gift of eternal life. So, in effect, we are hopeless. We are so because without a true knowledge of God, we don't actually know the perilous situation we are in. We are, as Paul put it in verse 1 of this chapter, dead in our transgressions and sins. Paul's words here are a wake-up call for all who believe that salvation is something we are entitled to 
or something that we can get for ourselves. Outside of Christ, the forgiveness of God and gift of eternal life are inaccessible to us. We cannot demand them, buy them or earn them, and without Christ, we are without hope. We cannot rescue ourselves, and nor can other people rescue us. So if you are outside of Christ, if you have not repented of your sins and by faith received him as your Saviour, can I implore you to take heed of Paul's words here? That without Christ your situation is hopeless? If on the other hand you are someone who has put your faith in Christ, but your heart has grown cold, can I encourage you also to take heed of Paul's words here? Remember what you were outside of Christ. Remember your hopelessness and how he rescued you by doing, and by doing so, you will realise how much you owe him, which in turn will reignite your gratitude towards Christ. But even if you are a believer here today and your heart hasn't grown cold, can I encourage you to make it a regular habit of remembering what you were outside of Christ and therefore what he has done for you? Because if we don't do this, we can all too easily forget what we owe him. And when that happens, our gratitude shrivels. But just in case we are in any doubt as to what it is Christ has done for us, the second thing we discover we need to remember here in this passage is precisely that, what Christ has done for us. And this we find in verses 13 to 18. We're in after having reminded us what we once were outside of Christ, Paul begins by saying, but now in Christ, Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. I wonder as you read those words, did you notice the centrality of Christ in them? What I mean by that is outside of Christ, that is to say without faith in Christ, we are far away from God as Paul puts it. That is to say without true knowledge of God, we are rebels against his sovereignty and strangers to the blessings of his covenant of grace. But in Christ, that is to say through faith in him, by his blood alone we are reconciled with God <clears throat> and have peace with him. In other words, our salvation depends entirely upon us being united to Christ by faith in him. By speaking about the blood of Christ, Paul reminds us what it was that Christ did to provide us with salvation. He shed his blood for us. Blood is symbolic of life in that it is necessary for sustaining life. So in a way, Paul reminds us here that just as physical life is impossible without blood, so too is eternal life. Only in this case, it is the blood of Christ shed off at Calvary that gives us eternal life. When by faith, we trust in Christ. The terms in Christ and by the blood of Christ in these verses, dispel the false teaching of universalism held by some which teaches that Christ's death upon the cross provided forgiveness for everyone regardless of whether or not they trust in him as their saviour. But herein Paul makes it very clear that it is only when we are in Christ, when by faith we are united to him, that we are cleansed from our sin by his blood. Within those verses, Paul also speaks about a dividing wall of hostility, which is a reference to the hostility that existed between Jews and Gentiles in that era. The Jews thought that the Gentiles, that is to say, everyone not brought up in the Jewish faith, they thought that Gentiles were dogs, fuel for the fires of hell, as one Jewish scholar wrote. Such was their contempt for Gentiles. It is said that if a Jewish boy or girl married a Gentile, then an actual funeral was held for them. 
because in the eyes of their family and community, they were dead. But the Gentiles were equally contemptuous of the Jews. It is said that they considered Jews to be enemies of the human race, a people filled with hostility towards everyone else. The dividing wall that Paul speaks about here is thought to be a reference to the wall which separated the Gentile court from the court of Israel, which was the area reserved exclusively, exclusively for Jews in the Jerusalem temple. Scholars tell us that it was a stone barrier, some one and a half metres or five feet tall, with warning signs affixed. A couple of those signs have been discovered, and the message on them was, no foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Basically, the Gentiles could only watch the Jews worshipping God. They were excluded from participating in it themselves. And if they tried crossing the barrier, even just to get a closer look, they would be lynched. Paul had bitter experience of this himself. As Acts 21 tells us, therein we are told that he was set upon by an enraged Jewish mob when they thought that he had brought a Gentile, who was ironically uh, an Ephesian believer, into the court of Israel. But Paul had not done so. On that occasion, he was only saved by the prompt action of the commander of Roman troops who arrested Paul and took him back to the barracks. So in essence, that wall told Gentiles that they were excluded from being the people of God. But it was not the only barrier. The other one came in the form of the ceremonial law, which dominated the religious, uh, Jewish religious life, and the observance of which was seen as compulsory in order to be part of God's people. So things such as circumcision, the material sacrifices, morning and evening, and other special ones, dietary restrictions, fasts, feasts and rituals for cleanliness were mandatory for anyone wanting to be part of God's people and to worship him. Failure to comply with those rules meant failure. Uh, you were not able to be part of God's people and worship in the, in the Jerusalem temple. In other words, unless you converted to Judaism and observed all of the regulations of the ceremonial law, then you could not be part of God's people. The regulations of the ceremonial law had been given to the Israelites by God to help them understand the seriousness of their sin and the holiness of God. But over time, as opposed to making them humble before God, it bred a sense of entitlement. In other words, they thought that by simply going through the motions, they were entitled to God's forgiveness. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But it also made them arrogant towards other people. Hence the hostility that existed between them and the Gentiles. So the ceremonial law was also a barrier that excluded the Gentiles from membership of God's people. But in verses 15 to 18, we're told that by his death upon the cross, Christ abolished the regulations of the ceremonial law and so destroyed the, law, the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. He enabled both people, groups, to be reconciled with God on equal terms. Neither had an advantage over the other. Outside of Christ, they were all equally lost, and united to Christ, they were all equally saved. As verse 18 puts it, <clears throat> for through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Christ's words here, or Paul's words here, remind us that by his sacrifice, Christ not only abolished the regulations of the ceremonial law, but he also abolished the condemnation of the moral law. That is to say, the Ten Commandments, which are the dividing wall of hostility between God and all those outside of Christ. Those commandments condemn us in our sin. Outside of Christ, we are excluded from obtaining access to God's forgiveness. But in Christ, the door is open to us. The wall of hostility is demolished. We have free, unlimited access to 
we are able to approach him in the confidence that because we are in Christ, we have found favor with God. Paul also reminds us here there's no pecking order, as it were, when it comes to salvation. There aren't people who are more worthy of being saved than others. And of those who are saved, there are none who are more important and have better access to our Father, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, than others. <clears throat> this means that in Christ, all of the social barriers constructed in our world, such as gender, race, social or economic background, count for nothing. They are demolished. But it is only Christ who achieved this for us. We could not and cannot do it ourselves. There was no other way beforehand and there still is no other way now. <clears throat> we need to remember what Christ has done for us, but we also need to remember the third and final thing Paul teaches us here in this passage, namely, what in Christ we have become. <clears throat> what in Christ we have become. This he does in verses 19 to 22. <clears throat> Therein he re reiterates the unity of God's people, united in Christ. And he also refers to them being members of God's household. In other words, as believers, we are part of God's family, which is an echo of chapter 1, verse 5, which says, In love he, pre he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> This emphasizes the closeness of the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father and the freedom of access that we have to him. But that is not all we can, we can derive from Paul's use of the word household. Because, we, or because it also reminds us that in belonging to God's household, <clears throat> we have a new identity. And with that comes a new purpose. This household is a church, and as Paul puts it, it is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles and prophets were God's messengers. They proclaimed the word of God to people. So what Paul means is that the church is built upon the word of God. With this in mind, then, it is no surprise <clears throat> that to undermine the church, the enemies of God, and his people focus their attacks on the integrity, authority, and sufficiency of Scripture. <clears throat> it's also why when churches deviate from the Word of God, that they start to crumble. In verse 20 onwards, Paul again highlights the centrality of Christ in the church, for he is the chief cornerstone. But what you may ask, does he mean by that? Well, in Paul's day, the chief cornerstone was the first stone carefully set in place in the foundation of a building. All other stones were then set in place with reference to it. So not only did it provide structural integrity to that building, but it also determined the alignment of that building. As Paul puts it here, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which the Lord lives by his Spirit. And therein Paul tells us that individual believers are in essence the building stones in the structure of Christ's church. But not only that, the Holy Spirit dwells within each one of us. Under the old covenant, the temple in Jerusalem was the place where God's Holy Spirit dwelt. But under the new covenant of Christ, he dwells in each believer as their sanctifier and guide. So Paul's words here remind us that as believers, we are part of the greatest, grandest building project in human history. This means that the church should be important to us, not only as a place where we come publicly to worship God, but also where we have fellowship with each other. It is also a place where by working with each other, supporting each other through prayer and practical ways. We can perform the good works Paul speaks, spoke about earlier. There are good works that we can do individually. 
but there are others which we can only do as part of a team, which the Lord has made us members of, as members of his church. A retired colleague in ministry once told me a story about a businessman he knew who employed a woman as his secretary. Despite having been told in no uncertain terms she had a troubled background and was not suitable for the role, she had been written off by so many other people before, but he graciously took her on, worked with her, and gave her the chance that so many others had not and would not. As a result of this, because he had not written her off, she became fiercely loyal to her boss. She knew that beforehand her situation was hopeless, that she was consigned to a life on the dole and the lack of self-esteem that life can cause. But he had changed all of that. And for that, she was immensely grateful. However, her gratitude was not just verbal. It was displayed in her work ethic, in that nothing he tasked her with was ever considered too much trouble. As believers, we should never forget what we once were without Christ, what he has done for us and what in Christ we have become. For remembering or for by remembering such things, we will nurture our grateful, gratefulness and that gratitude will act as fuel to us as we play our part in the kingdom building work that the King of Kings has given us whatever that work may be. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and dwell with you this day and forevermore. Amen.